You're listening to the Myerson Line. Life cycles, bicycles, fast lines, and hot takes. Bam, there we are. I can't believe it. We are actually, um, here we are with another episode of the Myerson line. Um, I want to start by apologizing to everybody for it being so long since our last episode. Um, a little bit of the backstory there. Basically, I was pretty disappointed with, um, the the, first one. Well, no, come on. (laughs) They were going good for a while, but um, we had a really good episode with Hassan Bahadi, and we lost 40 minutes of it. Um, and we had basically like the first 10 minutes and the last 10 minutes, and they were great, but um, that was a big blow. It was a lot of work, and it was a great conversation. I was sad to lose it. Um, but we also lost uh, the software, the website that I was using, Blab, to do it. And so um, we are back. We are relying on other technology, um, and I am... Also, obviously, um, trying to balance all this with taking care of a baby, which I'm not currently doing, but it does, uh, it does bite into my time to do side projects like the podcast. Tonight, we are back and we have Ryan Trebon as our guest, which I'm super pumped about. Hello, Ryan. Hello, everybody. Um, we were working on Bobby Lee as a guest too, and, and we were having a hard time scheduling that, and, uh, but I didn't want to keep, uh. I don't want to uh, wait. Bobby Lee? Yeah, well, Bobby's a good friend of mine. I don't know. I, I figured as soon as I said his name, you'd have something to talk about there. But let's... Oh, let's I like that guy. Yeah, he's a good guy. And there's going to be tons to talk about when we get Bobby on. But you've got stuff going on right now. It was timely. Um, you know, people were requesting um, that I have you on as a guest. But I didn't need necessarily anyone to push me to have you as a guest. You were definitely on the list. And uh, it seems like a good time to talk to you. So... <laughs> Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, no worries. So, um, a couple intro things. Obviously, uh, for people who've been listening previously, uh, we are part of the Wide Angle Podium Network, and apparently, in my absence, we've we've acquired advertisers. Um, despite the fact that I haven't been making shows, people have um, been happy with the shows that we made up until this point, and um, I really appreciate that. And uh, the service course in particular uh, has come on as a, as an advertiser sponsor, I guess it's advertising in this case, of a couple of the shows. And um, and I just I want to make sure I, I mention them and give them a shout out, say thank you. Um, uh, I, I only know uh, Ryan, who is the owner of service course, in passing from, um, you know, bike racing, the way we all know each other. And I haven't used this product, so um, I don't want to necessarily misrepresent it, but I'm certainly aware of, of the product that he makes and what he's doing. And it did cause me to go, um, I didn't know what Tampico fiber was. Ryan, I don't know if you know what Tampico fiber is, but it's apparently a plant-based fiber that they're making brushes out of, and yeah. it's supposed to be a nicer brush, so I want to check it out. Brush for... What? Uh, no. Well, I think you can use it for anything, but I think it, it works especially well for washing things. Um, oh, okay. I was going to say, I don't really have much hair to brush well, these you, days. Yeah, so. you and me both. <laughs> you and me both, bud. But uh, no, for bike washing, like, it doesn't, it doesn't, like, the grease doesn't stick to the brush. It doesn't, like, rub the grease back into your bike. Um, so it sounds, I don't know, it sounds, uh, does not sound like a gimmick. It sounds like a thing. I'd like to check it out. Really, Ryan, actually, if you're listening, I suppose, more than I need, you know, I mean, of course we all want to make money. It's nice to get paid to do the podcast. Um, I'd like to check your product out, because then I can actually, you know, really talk about it. So, there's my plea. Send me some stuff, bro. Yeah. Free shit. This is how you get all your free stuff, right? (laughs) Free stuff for money, as the uh, expression goes. We'll send you some free stuff for money. Uh, all right, so let's get after it. So again, um, thank you to Service Course. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I will put some effort into making sure I'm more familiar with your product, but I do appreciate the um, the support and the sponsorship. So, Thanks, Ryan. Ryan. Appreciate it. Yeah, and I didn't mean you. Yeah, Ryan Newell, oh, who is the owner hey. of the business. But I mean, you know, thanks all to you Ryan's for being good here. Ryan's. Yeah. Um, man, where should we start? Like, at, like I said to you, this is like, if I wish we were at the bar having a drink. You drink? 
I've never actually... beer right now. Dude. Yeah, perfect. I thought that you did. It's but... kind of that shitty uh, Utah beer, but it's still beer nonetheless. Oh yeah, it's what it's what it's the maximum like two and a half percent or something in Utah. No, this one's four percent. Oh, you're gonna get arrested. Yeah, it's double, double. I, I had to one for the price of two. You now, are you allowed to bring alcohol over state borders? Like, oh, yeah. Hey, oh. yeah, you can do whatever you want. Well, I don't think that's state true. Co- I don't ah, that's, a, that's the way I live my life. <laughs> yeah, <by. laughs> you might think that you can do what you want, but I don't think they think so. Um, it's like it's the rules if you get caught doing it. Yeah. Then you just say, hey, I didn't know I can do that. So you're you're riding dirt bikes and mountain bikes, like you're chilling with bros, hanging out in Utah? Yeah. I'm mean, actually, it's a it's friends of mine that I started, was first traveling around the country with back in like 2000, 2001, driving across the country in a Ford Econoline van, a bunch of mine from Tennessee, and um, it's his birthday tomorrow, and they come out, they do a trip every year, and so they invited me out, and I was like, I don't have anything going on. Sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this yeah. is the wonderful part of retirement, is you get to do all the shit that you've been saying no to for the past 15 years. Um, you, can, you can do them. It's amazing. Yeah. It's been, it's, yeah, I got here last night and rode today, and it's been awesome, besides throwing myself on the ground pretty hard. Uh, Come on. <laughs> Dude, I crash all the time. It's like you go out there and you're having fun and you're dicking around and doing stupid stuff. And like sometimes it's like just a, oh, that was funny. And sometimes it's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> Don't you think that's when the worst crashes happen is when you have your guard down and you're just like, like Britley Bowman, like broke her ankle, like riding off a, off a bike path, like off a curb, like just turning at like one mile an hour. You know, I feel like that's when you break your collarbone or get a concussion or something. Yeah, I'm always, Yeah. I don't know. Shit happens. It's, you want to go fast and take chances, and it's about to happen occasionally. Yeah. Just, they, they always seem to come in like waves. You know, you go through like ten months of no crashes, and every ride you'll crash on. You're just like, what the hell am I doing wrong? But you know, here's the thing. So this is a retirement thing for me. Like I've been watching a lot of skate videos, and I and I bought a new skateboard, and I thought that would be one of the activities oh, that God. I would. <laughs> well, right, right. So, and you know, everybody's always like, I get a lot of shit because I I don't train in a helmet normally, and you know, obviously I wear a helmet when I'm racing or whatever. And I don't want to have a helmet conversation. That's not the point. But you watch what these kids are doing right now, and it's it's not just that the tricks are super technical; it's that the risk factor is gigantic because they are doing like. They're alling off like 14 step flights of stairs, kick flipping, you know, maybe doing it like going into something backside. Like they're going into things blind, like where their their back is yeah. facing the direction they're going and then grinding or sliding something and then and then uh, flipping or kick flipping off of it. So there's a lot of bails that are happening while they're moving basically backwards and they land on their ass. And that's how you smack your head, right? Like, because okay. you can't, it's hard to hold your head. As a skateboarder, you, I think this is why I haven't had a lot of injuries in bike racing when I've crashed and why I don't crash often is you learn how to like fall off a hand railing and not hit your head. Um, you, it's like a skill that you acquire. Um, but man, I, it's, I, so I'm, af- I'm personally afraid of high penalty for failure maneuvers i like tech it's why i like cross and why i don't like jumping shit that's why there's a video of me like running off that a line you were making fun of me for like i can't jump stuff you know well, I mean, not when you're not you can't jump stuff when you're not on your bike i mean we can start with that <laughs> preface it with that way well, i got some things to learn for sure i got like uh, there are skills that i definitely do not have but but i was scared of that i was legit scared of smashing my face on the ground you know and just getting it wrong because i don't have i never learned how to jump um i don't leave the ground that's why i'm good at cyclocross because i'm good at like technical things i'm good at lip tricks i'm not good at air so uh, i get you. i don't like leaving the ground that often i don't mind doing drops and stuff but i don't like jumping stuff either it's... yeah well stop hitting the ground though bro I mean, I, I, I wanna, then you're going to say stop having fun. Uh, yeah, no, good point. <laughs> this, this is a good segue into my first memory of you. And so one of the, I like to, early in the show, I like to talk about like how, how I know my guest and how my guest knows me, like when we first met. And I genuinely don't remember the first time we talked. I don't remember like becoming friends with you. Fuck, I'm not even sure if we're friends now. But I do remember, I think it was, when was Napa Nationals? Was that 2003? No, dude, that was like 2001. No, I actually have it handy. I actually looked. Yeah, it was 2001. It was 2002. I'm looking at it. I'm looking at it. 2002? Yeah. yeah okay. So 2002. Because you yeah. got third. 
Yeah. Adam Craig won. This is an under twenty three race. Adam Craig won. Valerie Wicks was second. You were third. Um, yeah, but I was leading the race and then double flat, and I didn't have a pit bike, so I had to ride two flats. Way to yeah. way to steal my story, bro. <laughs> that's my whole story. That's that's the story. So I was watching the race, and I was like, "Wow, this Ryan Trebone kid. I don't know who this kid is." This is amazing what he just did. If he ever learns how to ride his bike, he's going to be really good. That was my first impression of you. Like, wow, he double flatted and and rode all those guys back down. Oh, no. You rode. Well, no, because you were leading and then you double flatted. And then you rode like you rode back up to third from like 10th place. Yeah. And you rode by Powers and like Josh Anthony and Alan Obi. Troy oh. Wells was in that race. It's actually a pretty good. No, I think he was it's younger. Yeah, that was awesome, man. That was they had fourteen inches of rain that week. Yeah, yeah. That was like that was a burly day. My well, best I, we, that race was at the start. I don't know who it was, but it was like a downhill pavement start to a right hand turn, and it, you know everything's soaking wet. And then one, one kid like couldn't stop, man. So I just remember him both feet on the ground, squeezing his brakes, trying to slow down, and just off the road into the vineyards. <laughs> I mean, there's a reason we never got invited back there, right? Like, oh, we destroyed vi- that yeah. place. <laughs> vines got broken, like, like ten thousand dollar wine vines. You know that we're, we'll never yield grapes again. Also, we could also we could ride around on our bikes. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, yeah. If they didn't get that rain, it probably wouldn't find. It wouldn't have been a big deal. But that was that was one of the wettest nationals I remember. Yeah, but that Start was my rain, race in the rain. Finish in the rain, podium yeah. in the rain, yeah. pack up, go home in the rain. It was awesome, man. That was yeah, that was a hard week. But that was that was my first impression of you. That was the first time I encountered you, and like you know, I think you stuck with Cross after that, and you were around. Um, Did we race the next day in the elite race together? I don't know if we had it. I don't know if it was set up like that back then. Yeah, yeah. What did you finish in the elite race there? I don't recall. I could go look. I, got, I, I think I, I think Barry was ninth and I was tenth, so I think we might have smoked you. Boom! I'm gonna look right now. I got it open. <laughs> Page one. Yeah. There's only 23 people on the results list, and I am not on it. Oh, just couldn't pull it through. Huh? Apparently not. That was the um. That was that was those were in my semi-retired years. Those were the years where I was just coaching, and I was, I was 30 at that point, and I had no. I didn't think I was ever going to turn pro or anything. I wasn't. I wasn't trying to race bikes for a living. I was racing bikes for fun at that point. I actually didn't turn pro until 2003. It was the year after that, so I was still just horsing around at this point. All right, we'll give you a pass. Do you remember your first um, interaction? Um, aware? How did I get onto your radar? Because I don't remember. Again, I don't remember because that your race in oh. Worcester. Yeah, yeah, you Worcester. won my race in Worcester. Yeah, that was a, yeah. I remember that. I think that's the first time I may have actually talked to you. I don't know if it was at Powers' house the night after that or after Gloucester when everybody they lived in that shitty house. Yeah, where you guys would do the um, the drunk race, race over the stairs. Up. Yeah, yeah. We should talk about that. Um, yeah, I, I maybe then I don't know. I, don't, I mean, honestly, I don't remember. I, no, that I makes sense. Yeah, too many times too. So that was the uh, the Central Mass Cyclocross to end homelessness. It yeah. was. Uh, <laughs> It was a C1. It was the equivalent of a C1 at the time. And yep. um, it was the first race to have equal prize money um, for women. First UCI race had equal prize money for women. And yeah, you, you won it in the dry year, right? Yeah, I won. I beat Todd. Yeah. I beat Todd Wells that year. And then the next day it was Gloucester. And I rolled my tire with Todd. Me and Todd were together then, too. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And that's when we were still running like one day races. And that was Saturday. Gloucester was Sunday. And the yeah. next year, that weekend was supposed to be a USGP weekend, but the race got canceled, and then Gloucester became a double weekend and became USGP. Um, so much little history that I should write it all down at some point. But That was a good day. I like that race. That was fun. Yeah. The year before, it was super wet and super deep mud, um, and they were like, no big deal. Come on back next year. It was good. We did after, so after the homeless race, we didn't get invited back? We did. We did, we did it two years at that park. Um, but they basically, oh, we can get, it's a long story about that race, but it was really great. I got hired to run that race. I didn't own the race. Um, basically, a, a homeless shelter in the city of Worcester. Short story was just, they were they were bored of running like $100 a plate dinner fundraisers that no one showed up for and, and everybody kind of hated. And they thought, 
let's run a bike race and, and hire someone to run the race for us. And then we'll have an exciting event to raise funds around. Um, so it was a great concept and it was for me, I didn't take a dollar from them. They covered the operating expenses of the race. Um, I kept the entry fees as a way to pay myself and my staff. And then nice. they sold all the sponsorship. And so any sponsorship they sold was, you know, fund fundraising for the homeless shelter. So, you know, they brought like a hundred grand in, in sponsorship, which is way better than anyone in the bike industry really can do. <laughs> but it, in, in the end, it actually wasn't really enough. It was a lot of work for them and, and, you know, just not necessarily enough return. So we ended up not doing it a third year, but I wish all my jobs could have been like that, you know, where I didn't have any risk and I was raising, helping raise money, you know, providing event that raised money for a really good cause. And the reason why we had equal prize money for women was, um, at their insistence because, um, lack of income parity for women is one of the primary causes for, um, female homelessness. Hmm. Uh, women not making as much money as men as puts them on the streets much sooner than men. So a good, I learned a lesson there, even just working with those guys. It was good. Nice. I didn't know that either. Wow. See how informative this talk has been so far. I basically, this was meant to be, this is the education of Ryan Trebon episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, this is going to take hours. Uh-huh. Everybody just get a cup of coffee, hang yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be here for a while. Um, the, my other early memories of you are also just, like moving around. I feel like when I first met you, I associated you with North Carolina scene. And I know from, you know, being in a military family, there's like four different scenes that claim you as theirs. I feel like Florida thinks you belong to them and North Carolina (laughs) thinks you belong to them. And then, I mean, I think you ended up in Bend on your own. That was your choice. Were you somewhere else before that? Uh, I started racing mountain bikes in like Washington state and then we moved around a lot, you know, I mean in the military, but I started racing mountain bikes in Florida, um, like more seriously, you know, and then the kind of in the Southeast. And so I I would say I, I cut my teeth mostly in the Southeast racing. Um, and and I started racing cross, you know, when I was in North Carolina and stuff on a mountain bike. And so I definitely have like, I mean, super strong roots to the South, you know, it was my life out there, but I mean, I feel for me, as any time, any, the moment I was able to choose kind of where I wanted to live and had the ability to do that, that's when I moved out to Oregon. You know, um, it's just I, I prefer being out on the West Coast. It's yeah, more yeah, for me. sure, understood. You know, so, yeah, um, yeah, and so I've been out. I've been out in Oregon ever since, and I dig it. I ain't going anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, but it must have been great um, coming up in North Carolina. I think people do know that there's a scene there now, but I would say in the early to mid 2000s people didn't realize like what Tim Hopkins was up to there and how good the races actually were and that he really grew a a scene there which I assume that's that was your crew right like yeah yeah totally I mean those guys I mean they they have really good varying terrain you know Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. the coast or the sand hills region out to the mountains and stuff and you know it's not it was never like Oregon huge or probably will never be as big as like the cross stage but it's like serious racing they do a good job they put on all the events and they've yeah. turned out some good racers over the years as well too you know by having those events there yeah so, well if you haven't been back in a while i think it's even better than that now i think you'd be I surprised was in January. oh yes but right of course yeah <laughs> right well you so you but you know and honestly you can see from the astral event like what what tim's capable of but i mean even just the um weekend in weekend out races um have gotten much more popular and i think the scene in north carolina is really good i've always argued that the the biggest potential for growth is is in the southeast for cross north carolina south carolina georgia um there's a lot of bike racers there and i think they have perfect weather for year-round racing and like you said they have they have varying terrain they get mud they have grass just and they have their best cyclocross weather is in january you know that's that's when the races they are had the best. big series you know they had a series like the winter cross series mm-hmm, mm-hmm. December from january yeah you know and that's kind of I don't know, cold. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but good racing. Yeah. So when you finally got out, so when you were doing all that traveling, obviously you're you're tied to your family. You know, you're 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 living in all these places because you're moving with your family. How old were you when you finally got out from under that and and got yourself set up in uh, in Oregon? Well, I had lived on my own a few different times, like during high school, and then when I was like twenty. Um, and then my parents moved to North Carolina. I moved back there just for a bit because you know I was traveling and racing and stuff, and it's just kind of easier to live with your parents for free and so yeah yeah um basically i think after that year 
um, I went to Cross Worlds in Monopoly, Italy. I was like that March. I drove. I just packed my car with every shit that I could fit in it, and drove out to California for a month, and then went up to Corvallis, Oregon. And you know, I had been to Corvallis like two times before, and Barry was like, "Yeah, I have a friend that has a room." It's like 200 bucks a month and you can live in there. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. sounds awesome to me, yeah, man. Right. So like at a futon and a desk, you know, it was golden. <laughs> yeah. You know, what else do you need? You know, it's, I mean, it was pretty, it wasn't like this. Oh yeah. I need to take this with me. It was like, I got a suitcase and my mountain bike and my road bike. And that was it. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Well, and so one of the things that I've always wondered, um, you know, like you, I was kidding early when I said, I wasn't sure if you and I are friends, obviously we're friends, but I still think we're, um, you know, we only, we only talk like at races and on the internet, you know, like we don't, we, we haven't overlapped enough to sort of hang out really at races. And I don't know a ton about your personal life really. And one of the things I have always wondered is like what it's like having a military dad and how that has affected you as an athlete, as an adult, like dealing with setting goals for yourself and expectations and pressure and you know the reasons that sort of we race and and where our motivation comes from and like what you know what achievement means um coming from a military family or having a military dad how's that factor in for you do you think you must have considered this at some point well it's funny you meet if you met my dad you would never Besides him being tall and kind of looking similar to me, you would never be like, oh, this guy was a general in the military yeah, and worked on like, you know, <laughs> special ops and special forces for primarily his entire career. He just doesn't come off that guy. He's unassuming. He's, he's not, he's not what you would expect. And so, you know, and, and we always, we weren't ever raised with like this idea of, um, I don't know. It's weird. My, uh, like my dad and like his dad are the same. Like they're just, they're kind of like well adjusted, not well adjusted. They're just, there's not like, yeah, I mean you, you, that is just a reality. I think people go like, Oh, it must be hard to move all over the time. And I go, not really because it's just the reality you're used to in life, you know, yeah. and you, there's no other choice. And so it's not like it, you, I think it makes you more well-rounded and adaptable things because you're used to being someplace new. you're used to not having any friends you're used to talking to people that you don't know and constantly doing those things you know and i'm sure there's just negative people will psychoanalyze and make negative things about it as well too but i have zero zero negative side of this i i think i have zero negative thoughts about being raised in, being born and raised in a military family for my whole life you know and like yeah. i think it's only been positive stuff i've got to see the country the world and it's been awesome you know and you know, my dad's like, he just, his dad was very, uh, kind of empowering of them, not overbearing, didn't have this thing where you had to, you had to meet certain expectations. It was like, we, my dad's like a kind of, a, not a free spirit because a free spirit's the wrong word for me and it's the wrong word for him or just more like kind of walk to the beat of your own drum. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. You uh, pick your own path. And you allow like to yourself to fail and allow your children to try things and not like be too cautious about them. My dad was like 16 years old and he got to fly solo from Southern California all the way up to like Vancouver, BC in an airplane. Uh huh. His dad has let him. He like said, Hey, go do this, you know, and like don't call me, just you know, call me every other day or something and let me know how it's going. You know, it wasn't just like thing over. My dad's the same way. He wasn't strict. He's not super strict, you know, it's like doesn't definitely doesn't pick around, but it wasn't like he was like this strict, like by the book kind of person you would expect out of the military. And so, and I, I think I've taken a lot from him, like in terms of my personality and stuff like that. And like just hardworking people and, you know, and like to have fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think when you reach the level um, of success, let's say in your field, no matter what your field is, you probably do have a certain amount of, um, uh, well-adjustedness, let's say, you know, yeah. he's, he's not a drill sergeant. He's a general, you know what I mean? He's, yeah. They groom for, they, they select people and like position them for personality types mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. You know, versus like achievements, right? They want these kind of people in these certain jobs because that's what the job requires. Yeah. And I think, I think the same thing with like racing and stuff is like, you can't take somebody that doesn't want to do this or doesn't have the aptitude for it and put them in it you know it's too hard and it's too much sacrifice and effort here and there that you have to the people that are good aren't just good because they know how to ride a bike fast 
yeah, good yeah. for a yeah. variety of reasons that nobody even sees, you know? So this is perfect because one of my other questions for you was, is where then has your motivation come in your career as a professional athlete? So when you realized you were, you were good at mountain biking, you were good at cycling, this thing that you like to dick around and do, when you realized you were good at it, maybe there was an opportunity for you to make a living actually racing. Um, you know, what, what has motivated you? Where's your drive? Where's your drive come from? You know, I mean, for me, like racing is always my training motivation has varied over the years. Like it's, as I've gotten older, it's changed to the things that like excite me about doing, but for racing, like I really, I enjoy racing. I enjoy like, I enjoy that feeling when you know, you're going to make an effort or cover an effort and you, you kind of take a moment to like, regroup your 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 thoughts and breathe and then it's just all out you know and i like that part about racing yeah for me it's like it's this when you dig deep and someone else is digging deep and like you can crack that person that's like it's satisfying you know and like that's cool and like i I just i've always liked racing you know when i was younger training like was exciting for me and like you know when i was 2004 to 2008 or so like i really i would say got off on like training and seeing how much I could do, like the workload I could manage, the hours I could do. And like, we do these intervals and just be like, yeah, man, like I just did four 20 minute intervals at this power, you know? And like, I wasn't even like, I felt good afterwards and I did it again the next day, you know? And it's just like, you know, you do these workouts and like the workouts kind of like, I was excited because it was all like uncharted territory, you know, it was like, oh, let's just see where we can go with this, you know? And like, but I still always love just riding, you know, like, uh, but I, I liked the training part. And then it went from like, I wasn't so in much into training. Training was like the way for me to get to the races because I wanted to race and I wanted to ride, you know? And so, yeah, um, yeah, it's hard. It's, I think, I think everybody kind of their motivation and what excites them varies from year to year, you know, every year it's something like you have to, you gotta find some way to keep yourself motivated because it's too yeah. damn hard otherwise. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think uh, I, I've, I know how it went, it went this way for me, and I feel like I observed it from a distance um, going this way for you, but um, I agree that you go through this whole period of um, seeing what you're capable of and trying to increase your workload capacity and, and finding out you know, what's the, what's the end point of your talent through training, you know, how much training can you finish. And then if you get to that level and it's good enough to have a career racing and you're happy with the level that it's gotten you to and the opportunities, you know, the market will, will bear you a certain amount. Um, I know for me, it got to the point where I knew I wasn't going to get any better and I was okay with that. Well, of course I was in my late thirties at this point anyway, so I I didn't necessarily expect to get better, but I knew how to prepare myself and do the training to get myself to a certain fitness level that would allow me to do my job. And I loved my job. And so I still liked training. But every year I'd show up in Tucson and I would do exactly the same training that I did the year before. And I'd know, I'd know by this week I needed to be making this many watts for this many minutes. And if I stayed on that schedule, I'd reach this certain fitness level in time for this race. And I'd show up at that race and have the fitness to execute the job that was expected from me. And once I could do that, that's why my career lasted as long as it did because that I, I loved it and I could go back and do it. Uh, do did you feel like you got to that point as well in these past few years? Let's say before you had your back injury, were you you feel like you were at the point where you would reach this? Let's call it a comfortable level, and we'll talk. I want to talk more about that, but no, because I, I mean, I no, I never was like I I have this sensation, right? I know what it feels like to what I needed to feel like. Um, training to know like I'm gonna go to this race and do well that's why I could always I didn't have to race my way into fitness I could go out there and train and I was always really good about just like putting big efforts in doing the work and like I could show up and race off of training versus like needing that race into it you know um and yeah I don't know I just for me it it was never this like I need to hit this number or be able to do this was like I need to feel intrinsically in myself that like I'm ready for this you know, and like if I didn't feel ready for it, I wouldn't race as well. But you know, like once I felt like I'm good, like everything's good, like the legs are working, everything's going well, like I was good. And that could have been a mental block. It could have just been, you know. But it's just when I would ride, I I would 
you know, after four or five hours, I'd like this sensation that I'd get like, you know, like your legs, like you didn't run, ever run out of energy. You yeah. Had yeah. Yeah. Reserves. And it was like, all right, we're feeling good now. I know when to back off and get ready for the races. You, uh, you work with Jim Miller. Was he your, co- he was your coach, right? Jim Lehman. Oh, Jim Lehman. Sorry. Yeah. I worked with Jim Lehman since. That's what I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I knew yeah. that. And I, yeah, I just misspoke because I did New York, but Jim's a very well respected coach with a lot of successful athletes. Um, and so even if you were – you're almost describing like paying more attention to your sensations than the numbers. But I assume you were always collecting data for Jim. Yeah. Yeah, of course. And I mean for the lot, for a large period of time, yeah, we were constantly sharing stuff. And then it turned into like – me and Jim are great friends now. We've been working together you know, for 12 years. That's a yeah. long relationship. And um, it became more of like uh, – confidant yeah like, yeah absolutely like, bounce of things off of versus yeah. like because yeah. you get to a point where you're like i know what i need to do i know how to get there like i don't need constant guidance on that it's just i need someone to like look over your shoulder yeah. yeah or yeah. just be like jim what the fuck man i don't know what's going on yep. you know? yeah like, yeah exactly and it was more like i'm frustrated with my girlfriend i'm frustrated with this sponsor i'm frustrated with adam myerson you know mm-hmm. it's just yeah. like he's someone that you could talk to and it was like an impartial and he'd tell you if you're full of shit and he'd tell you if you just need to toughen up you know yeah so i think that's the natural progression of a of a successful coaching relationship that after a while the athlete should be able to hear the answers in their head um and the sound of their coach's voice in their head when you know they've worked with them long enough but you still need that um you still need to check in and get that you need need, a sounding board you need someone to help you keep your ego in check too um i think as an individual self-coach person sometimes you maybe take risks or you do things on pride you want something to be true, and so you pretend that it is, and then you, even though you know it's not, and then you do a workout you shouldn't do. Usually, it's it's an overtraining problem, not an undertraining problem. You usually, do a workout you shouldn't do because you're you want to be better than you are instead of just being patient. I think that happens a lot. I don't ever believe in overtraining. I'm an under resting person versus an overtraining person. Because I hear people talking about overtraining, doing 15 hours, 20 hours a week, and I'm like, you're not overtrained. You're just like not taking care of yourself after, before and afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Right, right. And so sure. like, it's amazing the amount of you can do and work you can do if you properly take care of yourself and let yourself rest and forego other things, you know. And I think too many people, they think, oh, I'm tired from training. It's like, no, you're tired because you were out hanging out with friends or yeah, yeah. Or hike with your girlfriend or did all this other stuff that is not conducive to being a fast bike racer, which is hard to give up. Yeah, lifestyle. So much of success in the sport and I think, I think for me later in my career, but also I think for like masters athletes and anyone with a job, but I think for pro bike racers too, um, you know, lifestyle is everything. And I think this is why so many of the American guys, and I want to talk about this with you, have a hard time, you know, trying to be successful in Europe. I think Jeremy struggles with this now is, you know, Belgium's not awesome. Like I know everybody romanticizes Belgium, but it is, it's not California, you know, and it's a tough place to – things that you take for granted here, like just being able to stop at a convenience store for a Coke and a Snickers bar on a training ride, you know, are things that are sometimes impossibilities in Europe. And that is like one tiny little example. Yeah. Um, but you, I know that you – this is also something that I've always wondered about your career is you, you have the engine to have been successful in European-style races. But my understanding is – you never liked it over there and were never excited about um, really giving it a go, like moving there or st- taking extended trips there. Is that, is that accurate? No, What's I mean, your, what, I, I yeah, really tell me about it. racing over there. Like yeah. I enjoy the races. I, that's, for me, I like hard, challenging races because in the U.S. our courses are just – they're not up for people that are physically strong. They, it, it, it's a whole – that's a whole different – I, I enjoy racing in Europe. It's it's yeah. It's – the rate, going to the races is cool. It feels important what you're doing. You show up and it's a big deal. And it's there's a lot of things that are annoying around the race, but I like once the race goes. And I like I like the challenge of the courses, you know. Um, I don't like living in Europe. It's just it's not it's not where I'm from. It's not how I want to be, you know. It's and people go, Oh yeah, Belgium's really nice, and it's like all these tiny little roads. I'm like, yeah, but the roads unless you've lived there your whole life, it's fucking confusing as shit to ride around yeah and so the yeah. training's hard because it's hard to link in a section where you're getting 
a quality workout when you don't want to ride straight down a canal for two hours and turn around and ride straight back the canal, you know, like yeah. you want to, this is the only time you really leave the house during the day is like, what else do you do when you're in Belgium? Like you can't, you don't go out to it anywhere, you know, you ride and that's the, basically the only time you leave the house and you go to the store and then you go home. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, I just, I never, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a West Coast kid, man. I just, I, that's where I want to be. And it, I've spent, you know, a lot of, I don't think people realize how much time I spent over there from 2005, six, seven, and eight, you know, like racing. And I had enough. I was just like, I like being over here. I like doing the races, but like, I don't want to live here anymore. You know? Yeah. It was hard. You're by yourself. You know, I spent Thanksgiving by myself. I spent a lot of like, you know, me and Jeremy were there together for like three weeks and then he left and I spent another three weeks there alone in the house. Right. right. And like, what do right. you do? Like the only time I interacted with anybody was at the bike races, you know? And then I rode by myself, came home, sat around, looked at the internet, went to bed, you know, like <laughs> it I, wasn't very exciting for three weeks. It was kind of just like, this is boring. <laughs> I, I think American fans have a hard time understanding that because I think it's very easy to romanticize Belgium because we just watch the races, whether it's road races or, or the cross races you know, the the cycling culture is so strong, but, you know, as I say to people all the time, the reason why the cycling culture is strong is because Belgium is kind of a miserable place and the cycling <laughs> culture fits in really well with that. It's a brutal, hard sport, especially cross, you know, it's, it's, if it's an agrarian society that is like kind of founded on this like hard life, hard work, lousy weather, um, and you sort of accept that, like cyclocross is, that's, a cycle cross is the perfect expression of that. Um, but that doesn't mean you, you want to do that. You know, it doesn't mean like you want your life to be miserable all the time. It's like some guys adapt to it. You know, like Jonathan Page adapted to it. It kind of matches his personality. He was comfortable there. It was never easy for him either. He didn't exactly love it there. He has lots of stories that he can tell about how much he struggled you know, trying to establish himself there. Oh, totally. You know, I mean, he's traveling with his, his, his wife and stuff, which I think probably makes it a little easier when you're not alone. But, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's they're not, they're, they're, Belgians are really friendly people. Yeah. They're not welcoming at first, right? You, they're like people, you have to prove yourself and then you're cool. It's yeah. not like, hey, welcome, American, you're awesome. It's like, what are you doing here? Like, look at you. You're an idiot. You don't even know what you're doing out there. And it's like, well, all, all those statements are true, but like, I'm giving it a, a shot. You know, like, and then they respect that. You get respect for the effort for oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. They feel honored by your effort. I think one thing they love is they love the sport so much that they're always flattered that we want to come over and attempt it. Even if you get mocked a little bit at first, you're right that when you win them over, they're like, it's flattering for them that we, we all want to give it a go. Yeah. Um, my first winter there, I was in Switzerland. I had a very different experience, you know, because it was Swiss culture and I lived with a family and learned how to speak German and, um, and it was the nineties, you know, so sport was also different. Like Belgium hadn't taken off. So the Switzerland was still the place yeah, where, the, yeah, where it's where the best races were at the time. The area mountains. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, of course I was a hundred percent in the wrong place for my like skill set and body type, but um, I was actually better off in Belgium, but, but it was a completely different experience. Than I think you guys had going over later in a developed Belgian environment, um, you know, with TV and everything else. And so, yeah, you know, we, you know, we went over there and we had like, uh, Noel, uh, young Kerry and his wife and, um, Chris DeVos and we had, you know, Mario and Luigi and all those guys and they were awesome. They were super supportive and they did, they bent over backwards and helped us as much as they, as much as they could, you know, and it was, we didn't lack for support, you know, like on the race course and stuff like that. That was all easy and taken care of. It's just, it's everything else. It's, yeah. Yeah. You know, 20 hours of the other 20 hours of the day. That's hard. <laughs> well, and so, but this ties back into me wondering if you had reached sort of, um, like a comfortable level in your career. And I, and I felt like a dovetail with that. Like I noticed that you were spending less time in Europe, or that you'd kind of given up on, on chasing the European races, but you also were on a good team here. You had a good contract. Things were going well. I feel like 2006 was, I mean, we're, we're, we're jumping backwards a little bit, but I feel like 2006 was, seems to me like it was your, your best year results wise. It's when you like, you won nationals, you won the GP. Um, I feel like, I don't know how you did at worlds that year, but you killed everything that year. And I know you won nationals again. Was that your second nationals or was that your first one? No, I want to know as well. Yeah. So 
But then I think after, and so you were still on the way up and still sticking your neck out and still seeing what you could do in Europe. And I felt like at some point you were on Cannondale. Um, I wasn't in Cannondale until 2012. So I was with Kona 2003 through 2010. And then me and Dusty did the LTS felt program in 2011. Yeah. yeah. So, and so I think 2011 felt like me, my best year racing. That was the year that you did your own program? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I felt. I mean, that's. I felt 2006. I was just. I couldn't. I didn't. I couldn't do really do anything wrong. Like I won mountain bike nationals. Yeah. Won cross nationals. I won a. You know, I, I was just good. And like I, you know, Peaky it's one of those powers. things. It's like, how did you get there? I mean, work and I don't really know. You know, like it <laughs> yeah. just worked out and like I just everything kind of clicked. You know, and like, um, but you know, and then years after that, like you know, you have crashes. You have just off years. You can't. You can't stay, I don't think, at 100% forever. You know, you have periods where you're going to go down and then shit happens, you know, and then you just suck for a while and then you get better again. And yeah. So, I um, feel like that those years you were on Kona, that's where I really, where I got to know you and I was racing with you a lot and it was you and Barry. Um, yeah. And that was a great program and it was good. You know, they weren't like full cross teams yet, but you guys, it seemed like to me that you guys were good friends like you got along and you liked traveling with each other and i think that's so crucial to being successful is traveling with a, a crew of guys that you like oh yeah i mean um, me and barry are like i mean the moment we met in monopoly italy like we met each other at, like in napa but in italy we've been friends ever since you know and i talk to barry all the time on the phone and we still go even he's living in california we'll still go take trips and go ride mountain bikes and just shoot the shit you know it's like someone that i've always we've always we trained really well together um, in terms of what we wanted to do and we like doing the same shit and we like just having fun with it versus it being all about the training and stuff like that. We like to just dick off otherwise, yeah. you know, yeah. and it's like we're very similar but extremely different. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, he's a smart and thoughtful and interesting guy. Um, totally. he, uh, he had more going on than just bike racing, even though he gave bike racing everything. Um, he does look like Sideshow Bob, and I have a hard time not seeing that every time I see him. It's you should see him. His hair is even bigger now. No, <laughs> how can it be bigger, dude? It's like out of control. He hasn't cut it in I think two years. <laughs> well, so this is why I always laugh because so I think you you have this tall person problem of you know you get on the podium and you just you just can never put your hands up. Because it's what tall people do. If you have big boobs, you you like arch your back and hide. If you're tall, you never stand up straight. And so you're always on the podium with your arms at like right angles. And this is why you always look like the great Cornholio. Because you don't put your hands up ever. <laughs> you put your elbows out and you put your hands up at a 90 degree angle. And I just, you should just pull your shirt over your head at that <laughs> point. And so... And I, I think it's from being tall. Tall people never – they're like – it's like a shy, tall, tall uh, height-induced shyness, you know? You know how tall yeah. people are often yeah. – they're shy about their height. And so Yeah, man. You just want to like it's – you just want to blend in occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the – For me, I always tell people whenever I go to a bar or anywhere, like the only person I ever see is the other tall dude on the other side of the room. You know, <laughs> you I just, just see heads and then yeah, the other yeah, tall yeah. dude and you try not to make eye contact with them. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so you guys were the Twin Towers, but I just I thought it was Sideshow Bob and the Great Cornholio was <laughs> was how I characterized it. But but those were good oh. years. Kona's a they were a great sponsor. I mean, they're still a great sponsor, obviously for Helen. And I think is Barry still doing stuff with Kona? Yeah, he's uh he, he, he's, he's running the team. The, he's running the teams and their marketing stuff. And I think they hired Kerry Warner to race for him this fall. Oh, good. Um, just kind of East Coast based cross stuff, and you know, like they. <laughs> It was, I mean, they had a full program for a long time. You know, they have been a, a, a long-standing cross sponsor of teams and stuff. And it kind of, when I left there, they kind of went away a little bit. And I'd love to see them build it back up because it's a great brand. And they make great bikes, yeah. you know, and they have a long history in the sport, you know. And, like, we need companies that want to invest into it and, like, develop talent, you know. And, yeah. Um, that's Marketing. What it is. I mean, they gave me an opportunity, you know. I mean, without Kona, like, I probably would never – found really found a, a good home that was like welcoming and supportive of the thing we wanted to do because Kona was like we hired, got hired to race mountain bikes and we were like you know I would really want to start racing cross more and I want to go to Europe and stuff and they were like cool you know like 
we're into it. You well, know? who who so, was the marketing manager at the time? Like, who was the who was the human responsible for that? Uh, Mark Peterson. And is he still there? He left. Um, he left two thousand and nine, and then they hired someone else in two thousand and ten, and that's why me and Dusty got out of there because we just didn't we didn't drive. Our personalities didn't fit that well, and so we were like, we wanted to do our own thing. We wanted to kind of like just no, see that's what yeah. Make it. You know, and uh, luckily I had, you know, I wanted to do something. I just kind of wanted to, it to be more professional and things to be more timely. And so we even Dusty went and uh, it was awesome, you know, and like I, I, I still have a great relationship with everybody at, on a, at the company. You know, I still talk to them. I still see them at events and stuff. And they're by far my favorite sponsor I've ever had. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I imagine that you have positive memories there. Um, but it's the marketing manager change. It's on my mind a lot. Um you know, where you, uh, you, you think you have a relationship with a brand, and, but then you find out you actually have a relationship with a marketing manager and that marketing manager leaves and that relationship often ends. You know, I was just lamenting, you know, I'm really excited. I have a new shoe sponsor and I'm really excited about it. And I'm psyched to be working with Matt Shriver. Um, I, it's, I'm, I'm riding Bon Traeger shoes. So I'm, I'm psyched to be working with Matt Shriver. I've always admired Keith Bontrager and, and, you know, pay attention to what he does just as a, a person, a, as, a, as a designer, a guy. Yeah. But, but I, I was on Mavic shoes for eight years and through three, four, five different marketing managers. And then, and then finally, you know, there was a big enough change with, with them moving to Utah and everything else and new marketing managers came in and it's like not, it's like it never happened. It's like I have no relationship with this company. And, you know, when you, I think sometimes people don't realize as, a, as an athlete, you know, same thing. Like I was on Mountain Khakis, Smart Stop, you know, various versions of that team. Eight years on the same team. You leave the house yeah. every day. You leave the house every day in that kit. You, you are like more connected to those sponsors and to that team often than maybe the people who own the team. Or the the marketing managers that work at those brands, because you you literally wear that clo- the, those clothes every day. Your whole identity. So I mean, how many years did you leave the house like in Kona kit? And how oh, much is Kona it's... part of your identity? Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, eight years, and it's like it is. I think they can become intertwined, right? Yeah. yeah. Like you just see like yourself as like, oh, Ryan races for Kona or Kona, and then Ryan's racing cross from. And I think that's, but that's a that's how relationships should work, right? They yeah. should be. You want it to be. Not exclude. You don't want to be like, oh, here's Adam Myers, and it's like, no, Adam Myers and races for them, you know, like because yeah. then your job is to promote the brand, not to really promote your brand, you know. It's like that's why I've always been myself. It's like I'm not out here to promote Ryan Trebone. I'm out here to promote Cannondale, Kona, anybody, you know, like they get that's what they pay you for, you know, versus being like, you know, I don't know. That's just, my, I mean, I don't really. If I've never tried to promote myself as an individual, I, I would just be like, hey, cool, man. Like, yeah, yeah. But I, but I think there is a point where you have to um, value your own brand. It, it, it's a weird place to get to when you start to realize like, oh, hey, I have a brand. Or, or, you know, I think Jeremy is doing a great job of that right now where, yes, we associate Jeremy with Rafa. Um, but, you know, Jeremy is his own brand and – let's say something went wrong at, at Rafa or he had to sell that whole program to another sponsor. I think he would be able to do that because, oh, yeah. you know, he transcends the brand that he's currently affiliated with. Although for sure, Rafa and Focus have done an incredible job of sort of aligning with Jeremy and, and you know, his, his success, you know, his career has really taken off in the past four years. Yeah, it's one. Yeah, I, I think. I mean, I think it's. I think it's individually dependent, right? Some people they want to have. They they they. Jeremy's an, an an extrovert. He likes to talk. He likes the attention. He likes to do. And I'm not saying any of that as a negative. Like, yeah, yeah, no, understood. Jeremy yeah. along really well. We're, we're just different people, and it's like you can't. And I and I'm more of a. Jeremy likes to be in front of people, and he likes to be loud and stuff, and like. I just prefer to hang out and then like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, and so Ride it's your just, bike. yeah, totally. And it's just, I mean, that's, everybody's different. And I think, I think he's done a great job. I think he's has the only other real program out there besides Cannondale nowadays, you know, that's, it's professional and runs well and looks good. And it's something that they can sell to people. And I mean, yeah. that's, that's, it's, it take, it's a lot of work, you know, and, 
it's admirable work that he's done and it's impressive what he's got and it's cool to see yeah you know? especially now that he's able to expand it finally and it's not just a one person brand you know to bring yeah. ellen on like that's it's the beginning of a team you know and i, I think I, can I, mean, I like to give him shit about it all like nonstop, but i still respect the shit out of the guy so <laughs> i think this is the thing that people don't realize and i think this is one of the pros and cons of social media is um we're all real life friends and we take the piss out of each other on social media and sometimes we're let's say more than half kidding like sometimes we might um we believe the things that we're saying but and i don't just mean when i say we i don't just mean me and you i mean sort of let's say our group of bike racing friends um high level you know, like pro, our pro bike racing clique, let's call it. Um, we know each other well enough in real life that when we see each other in real life, we can laugh about it. We can talk about it more. We hear each other's voices, let's say, when we're reading each other's tweets. Um, and I think sometimes people who are eavesdropping on those conversations don't have that context. And maybe, like, I think sometimes people think that we don't like each other or that, yeah. or if you're busting Jeremy's balls, maybe they... I don't know. Maybe they don't realize we're all kind of laughing. Like, we, like, like we're reading it and we get the joke. And I don't know if everybody does all the time. Yeah, I mean, I think it's people think you have to agree with people to like them, right? Like, I mean, I disagree with a lot of people. That doesn't mean you don't respect them. It's like I don't agree with your opinion. I don't agree with your stance. It doesn't mean I don't. I dislike you as a person. I think that's a lost art in all society now or you only hang out with agreeable people that have the same opinions and everything as you is like, I'd rather talk to people that have counter opinions in me versus someone mm. spouting the same thing back to me. Because like, what do you get from that? You get nothing. I want to hear yeah. somebody else's opinion. You know, even I don't agree with it. Like I still want to hear what somebody else thinks in the inverse, you know, versus just talking about how cool our opinion is because it's the same, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's really funny though, because I want that experience in real life, and I, but I want it less and less on the internet. I am at the point now <laughs> where I want my social media experience in terms of who I'm paying attention to, to only be people who I'm interested in, whose opinions I care about, and generally speaking, who have a similar mindset to mine, because I'm not going to learn anything from anybody from no. like Facebook yeah. posts or comments, and in fact... I can, I'm trying to like, I want less negativity in my day. I don't want to be reminded of how many idiots are actually out there. Oh. And I don't want them to have access to me just because they have an internet connection. So <laughs> I am constantly unfriending, unfollowing, like trying to prune my, my social media experience down to being what I often describe as like my party. If I wouldn't invite you to my house, I, I don't really want you in my social media. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but you've passed the test. You're still there. We obviously must be friends. Yeah. I just like to give shit, man. I'm also like extremely welcoming to take it as well, too. You know, like I know some of the people will say will irk me as well. You know, but most of it just rolls off because why do I care? Like, what's it going to affect? It's my not day? actually that important, right? And that's why no, we can. Totally. That's why we can fuck around because it's not actually. It doesn't actually matter. Yeah. Yeah, people don't get that. I think people don't get that. Oh, well, give me all the shit you want. Everybody out there, just keep right away. Oh, oh, you're, you're in for it now. Yeah, you're you're gonna get it now. I think. This from you, East Coasters, because you got no sense of humor. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's good that we finally we busted your balls for a long time about Gloucester and coming back out to the East Coast, and it was good when you finally came out. People were psyched. You know, it's all the shit they gave you, and it's not like you didn't know it would be this way. But once you came out. Man, people were psyched that you were here. They just wanted to watch you race. Um, they wanted you at our events, um, and it was great. I think it was Gloucester that you finally came out to after not having been on the East Coast for a while. Yeah, I just haven't been there. Yeah, I think it was 2000. I don't think we went to Gloucester in 2011 or 2010 and 2011. So, like, it was, a, yeah, there was a good little stretch there. Uh, my favorite East Coast story is like I said some stupid article about the way Tim Johnson was racing, like it seemed like East Coast bullshit or something like that. Oh, and then yes, like, I remember. I forgot to, about like, this. Then we went to New Jersey, and there was like this whole group of people that were making these like signs, like "Go home, Ryan," or like, yeah, like, whatever. Yeah. It was awesome. It was like. It, me and Dusty were, it was the best thing ever, you know, and like I won the race that day. I remember riding by and like waving at everyone with the signs and it was just like, 
it was fantastic. That was like that was one of the best memories of racing I've ever had. Is because that was that to, like, um give that, a shit enough to like cheer for me or give it a shit enough to boo me. I just don't be apathetic to it, you know. I don't like when people are mean, but I think in that case, people were mostly being funny. I mean, they were being mean, but they were. It was. It was. It was funny. I don't think anyone actually was really mad about it. And they were. There were some upset individuals. That was out. funny. I, there. <laughs> There is like there are small pockets of of like real hecklers on the East Coast. It's generally not a thing, especially in the Northeast, and I think it's died out a lot. But I think there is um, you get some pockets um, every now and then. Um, I can't remember. I remember that race. It was it was USGP in that um, in New Jersey in that flat that flat field. I'm bl- yeah, it was Mercer, at Mercer, Mercer, but Park. on the other yeah. side of Mercer, not yeah. at the the side near the river that we went to the years after that. Yeah. Oh yeah, right. We raced in two different venues there, two different yeah. spots there. Yeah, just across the road. <laughs> yeah, right. same muddy flat field. Yeah. Um. Well, so let's let's kind of use all that to pull us up to where we are now. So you have your crash, you hurt your back. It's been two two years now. Yeah. Well. Yes. When was your crash? Two thousand fourteen. Um, so, uh, September, 2014, I crashed one of the handlebars, uh, just a, a, a good local series. It's kind of like before the season starts in Oregon, um, ended up fracturing like five vertebrae and a bunch of ribs. And so I was pretty beat up and I didn't really like allow myself to believe that it was that big a deal. Yeah. And so I started riding three and a half weeks after that and, uh, it never really healed. And I was suffered through like the whole spring and summer. And I finally kind of got a handle on things and like August and then started feeling better training in August and then race last year and I ended up herniating a disc in my back last year too. So, uh, you know, old people problem. But man, like, you got, you got second at nationals. It was 2014 nationals. So your crash was at the start of, yeah. I mean, it was three days before Vegas. Yeah. But not of, of the, what would be the 14, 15 season when you yeah. got second at nationals, it was the 13, 14 season, right? Yep. So it was right. just at the beginning of, and so we went to Boulder and then we went to nationals and then went to, to worlds after that. And that's when someone hit me in the back of the leg and split my calf wide open. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. right. so we did that. the cross season and started the cross season on a high note. That year. Yeah. Yeah. I was supposed to go to Japan and I couldn't race because I had, you know, like 13 stitches. I mean, I had this huge cut in my, in my calf. And so I was supposed to go to Japan and do that race. And so I ended up flying home from there. Um, and then, you know, I went to China and did the races in China and felt pretty good and came home. I was just doing a local tune up race, you know, before Vegas and shit yeah. goes wrong when it goes wrong. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Anything can happen. Like, and I think people like the fact that you're willing to come out and do those races. You know that you're not too good for the local races. I think it's it's a it's to your credit that you're not. Well, um, dude, that's like the most fun. You know, like I, I I honestly love going out there. I mean, the cross crusade like gets hard to to be taken. Like you can't really take it seriously because there's so much going on and there's 300 people on the course, and so yeah, you start laughing people on the second lap, and it's for me it's a way to interact with people that you like that wants to see you out there, and it's just fun to go race. You know, it's yeah. fun to ride around and you can still get something out of it without it being this like hundred percent serious. You yeah. know, I need to prepare for it. I more just have fun to go out there and you ride with your friends, you know, that your friends that aren't other professional racers that are taking it seriously on, you know, the big races. Right. Well, you could go do a threshold workout by yourself or you could go to the cross race. Yeah. You know I mean, I'd rather go out there and support, you know, Brad Ross, the cross crusade and all those dudes. And like, help that grow just you know as passively as me being there does but it, it, it means something you know sometimes and i like riding around and you heckle your friends that are in the same race in the yeah. master's race that you're yeah. lapped twice you know yeah. and so it's cool man like so i just like riding bikes well so you get to this point now where you know i, I know like you kind of spent the summer i think you felt like you were physically ready to come back and you were but you didn't have a, a deal for this year and and i think you know, like Cannondale seemed like they were making their program a little bit smaller. And I feel like in the past couple of years, not that you had a conflict with Cannondale, I don't know anything about that. I don't mean to imply that you did, but I know like with your your mountain bike contract with with Scott Scott Tedro, yeah. Um, I, you know, I don't know all the details there. I know you had some kind of conflict there where you weren't going to all the races you were supposed to go to, and you guys kind of had a little public spat about it and it was really bad for everyone i thought involved but 
watching that from the outside, you know, with my hands over my eyes and kind of like looking through my fingers at that whole thing, like, no, Ryan, no, like, God, I can barely, like, it was, it was hard to watch. Um, so I'm one of those people that's like not, if I feel legitimately feel like you've kind of been dicked around a bit, like I am not afraid to be like, that's fucked up. Yeah. I don't agree with that. And like, if you won't get a hold of me, I'll make sure everybody knows that what you did is fucked up. You know, and it's funny because me and Scott get along really well and we're, we have zero issues with each other. Like we talk, I talk to him all the time on the phone and like, he's a, he's a good dude. It's just, he's got one personality and I got the other. And sometimes they go well and sometimes it's like fucking button heads, man. And, and it's good when you can realize that when you work with someone, you know, and like I would work for Scott and do something because I understand him and he kind of understands me more now yeah. that it makes things easier. Um, you know, with, the thing with Cannondale is like, I never, I don't have anything bad about Cannondale. Like it's, you know, I think I was more a, a Cannondale on Stu's insistence, right? I think Stu wanted me to race for him. I wanted to work with Stu. Um, Stu could have been with any other brand and I would have gone with him, you know, yeah, um, yeah. because I like him. I trust him. Um, you know, it's it just they are. I was at Kona, and I got Canada right in terms of the relationship. You know, Kona, I just never felt like I fit in there in terms of their the way they did things, in terms of their brand, in terms of their marketing. It just a little more corporate than Kona. Yeah, and it just it, but in that, it's just not yeah. as a criticism. Yeah, that doesn't have to be a criticism. It's just a different approach. Totally, and the people there are just different. You know, they're like they're. It's it's go ahead say it the, go ahead say it East Coast. Versus, yep I knew that's where we were going <laughs> it's he's like East Coast mentality and yeah, it's versus yeah. like the guys at Kona are just they're like bros you know? yeah they're yeah. like we they're people you would ride bikes with and hang out with and like I like the guys that, there's a lot of guys that came there that are awesome you know and I would never be like that was a bad mistake I shouldn't have been there it was an awesome four years and you know when I got hurt I didn't race that whole year pretty much and then they, they care, still yeah. paid me yeah. you know like, yeah. that's something to be said for that so totally. you know it's just it's whatever you know and not every relationship's supposed to work out right that's why yeah, you did your have, time there the yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah it ran so, its course yeah yeah but and, I mean I still like Stu, me and Stu still get along and I talk to Stu all the time and he's a great dude and like yeah, but there's not much money out there right now. And and I'm you know, it, it may be surprising to some people that if you still wanted to race that you weren't able to find a you know, spot. I, and I know there's plenty of people who like you know, I know I know Adam a kind human was more than happy to give you bikes. You, you weren't just looking for someone to give you bikes. You needed a you were yeah, looking for a program. I turned down a couple of different offers that I had. Yeah. Um because it's never about the money, but if for me if it feels like what the back end, the support structure isn't there to be, it's not worth my time if it's going to be a hassle the whole time. You know, like that's what I don't want. I want to go there and race and I want to, I want us to be on the same mindset of what we want to accomplish. Not where I'm fighting tooth and nail for everything to get this done. And it's like, well, why do you need that? It's like, what? I did. I've been doing this for 16 years. Like <laughs> it's just because, you know, like yeah. just, and it's not being like a prima donna. It's just like, I don't, there's certain things I know from experience that need to get done or should be there available. And, and it, it's fine. It's, I'm, I, I'm kind of glad it didn't work out because I had been talking about it for a couple of years, um, stopping after 2000, after 2015 racing, um, and had kind of a job lined up on the side and that fell through. And then I was like, what am I going to do? And I'm like, I'm going to keep racing because I still like bikes. And I think it's a good, I, it was beneficial that it, nothing came together because I honestly, I'm not physically tired from racing. For me, it's more the mental aspect of like the constant effort to train really hard. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to travel anymore. Like honestly, like I don't want to fly back and forth. I've never spent, and as long as I've lived in Oregon, I've never spent a fall in Oregon. Right. You know, and for me, that feels good now. It feels nice to be here. You know, I definitely, I, I like the racing and I'll miss watching people race, but I'm not going to miss sitting on the airplane. I'm not going to miss sitting in hotel rooms. I'm not going to miss the really the hard efforts to get there, you know, like 100%. I know the work that it takes yeah. to get there. It's just like, I don't want to do that anymore. You know, I still want to ride every day, but I don't want to suffer, man. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I understand it intrinsically. I think for me, similarly, uh, the travel was the part that I liked the least. And I, and I've heard it said many times, um, as a pro bike racer, the, the travel is the hardest part of the job. Um, the traveling is harder than the racing. There's, 
nothing felt better than finally being in the race and realizing all the stress that you went through just to get there and race. And sometimes it even feel ridiculous, right? You, you think like, man, someone spent money on a plane ticket for me and gave me this bike and there's like a, a car is going to pick me up and like all this effort, all this money, like just so I can go ride bikes. It's, it's actually quite amazing. You know, it would hit me all the time. I never took it for granted when I would see all the fuss that was happening around me and aware of the money that was being spent just so I could race my bike. It always blew me away and was, and, and helped me stay motivated because I felt like I owed everyone something. And I was very lucky to, to have this opportunity, but God damn, I, any, every Friday I'd be sick to my stomach because I had to get on a plane. Yeah. Um, it was great to fly, it, but it's so hard to complain about that because you sound ridiculous, right? Like you're complaining. I don't, I don't know, man. If people have fallen as much as a lot of us have fallen, it's not. It's yeah, so but to some people would kill for the opportunity to have these problems, and I understand that. I understand that we sound. I feel like we sound ridiculous complaining about things like being flown to bike races. But I agree with you that it gets to the point where it's not worth it anymore. You've had the experience and the the dread of the stress of travel and being away from home starts to outweigh the enjoyment of the job. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, you just, it's everybody's least favorite part. I think once you start having relationships that you want to be home for, as well as a place like, so you have a relationship with where you live, you know, you like bend, you want to be in bend hashtag in bend. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you want to be in Ben because you, you love the place. You chose that place. You have a relationship with that place, but you also have a, a romantic relationship. You have a girlfriend, you have someone that you, I assume want to be home with you. You have dogs or a dog. You, you, you have relationships with your pets that I'm not even being funny. Like relationships with pets are, they're so important. You know, like I miss my pets when I'm traveling. <laughs> well, you know, add a baby to that. Wait till there's a baby. Um, involved in that and that well it just yeah i know i said (laughs) i said the same thing too but it it's that same feeling like it goes up another level from there but but missing my pets and my girlfriend and my house and my city you know that was enough for me but having a baby is like it's almost unbearable like i don't even like to go training because i i don't want to be gone for an hour so i you know so i understand what you mean i want to just bring it back around like at some point, the cost, you know, it's just cost benefit. At some point, the cost of all that travel, the stress of all that travel, I totally get it. Just wanting to be home for it. So, yeah, man, it's just like everything has its, everything runs its course in life, you know, and sometimes you get it. It's no one, I think we don't win to say when or like this is enough versus dragging it on. And like, there's a lot of people out there that just don't, they don't know when, when's when, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and sure. I could, I could have easily raced for another three years, but like, at what cost, you know, like for me, like it's, I feel comfortable. Like, I mean, I could have, I could have won more races. I could have won less races. It's just, I told some of that. I'm like, very few people get to choose, decide how they quit racing. <laughs> right. You know? Right. That's not like, I want to go out after I've done this or I want to go out when I win this. And it's just like, dude, like you're just chasing a, a, an unrealistic goal. And sometimes you have to go now is good. Like I'm good. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 had the same opinion. I feel like that's why I stopped when I did. And, you know, I didn't stop because we had a baby. Um, we had a baby because I was stopping, you know, and I, <laughs> I was able to do, I didn't want to stop at yeah, the end of the Yeah, baby, you don't know how to pull out. Uh, that's okay. Well, I, you know, it's, I obviously <laughs> knew how else I would have had a baby 10 years ago. I made it, I made it 10 years without making a baby. I think that's pretty good. No birth control and no baby for 10 years is I think that's no baby, no baby, no baby. Yeah. Sweet. <laughs> but I agree with you. It's good to stop on your own terms. And I think that feels good. And I think you are still essentially stopping on your own terms. You, you know, you could have taken a deal that was less than ideal just to stay in the sport for another year. I think the economy is a big part of it too. There, there are just not a lot of jobs right now. If someone came to you with the right amount of money, I'm sure and the right environment, I'm sure you would have considered continuing on, but oh, yeah, for they're, sure. they're I mean, not there. Yeah. It's the, the industry and sport doesn't know what direction it's going in right now. And the industry, the cycling industry is really challenging. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's, it's another four hours of a topic. And then, yeah. I mean, there's a, so many good people involved, but there's a lot of stuff that they shoot themselves in their own foot, you know? And you're just like, dude, like it doesn't have to be like that. You don't have to do that. You know, like, um, 
I think so, there's a lot of people in the bike industry working for less money than they deserve or less money than they would get in another industry because there isn't that much money to make in bikes and people use the love of bikes as a way to get people to work for them for less. And often, I think, more... Yeah, it's, I mean, you get, you, it's being a part of something you're excited about versus being a part of something you don't really like. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can go yeah. make printers all day long, you know, or sell printers. But how exciting is that? Versus, you yeah. know, at least with bikes, there's like you get to see joy from other people using it, you know. And it's there's not a lot. There's negative. There's always gonna be negative feedback from it, but most of it's generally pretty positive. Yeah, you know? yeah. And I mean, it's like there's lower expectations, you know, in the industry than there is in like Apple. You know, <laughs> yeah, right? Sure. Yeah, I, I think that lower the lower expectations is the problem, though. Like we have to find a way to match the passion that we all have for bikes with the, the professionalism. Ex- yes. We need more <laughs> professionalism. There's, we shouldn't sacrifice um, professionalism for enthusiasm, but I do think oh, that there's, that, there's probably about 4,000 old bros out there that need to leave the industry before all that. Yeah. <laughs> and unfortunately they're the ones that are in charge of a lot of big positions, you know? Well, but if there was more money to make in bikes and the salaries were bigger, we'd attract better talent and maybe we'd lose a little bit of the passion. But I think there are plenty of passionate people about bikes who went to other industries, aerospace or, you know, whatever it is, because oh, yeah. there's more money. And they were like, God, I love bikes, but I have to feed my kid. Yeah. You know, so I think that's a bummer. So, well, so what I, I was really excited to read that you had squirreled away enough money that you're you're not strapped, that you're not feeling pressure. That was really great to hear and i think not many people can say that so that's a combo of you having gotten good contracts but also been wise with your money um and and so that was uh made me feel well, warm inside to hear that you weren't hurting for cash but what are you yeah. going to do next you know i don't know yet i mean i i never wanted to get done racing and being like shit i gotta get a job next month because like bills are due man and i got like eight dollars and you know, and so I've always been pretty, I don't, I buy a lot of stupid shit here and there, motorcycles and cars and crap like that, but I don't generally, I don't spend a lot of money doing other things and I've been fortunate enough to have good sponsors and paid adequately, you know, and proportionally what you should make, uh, athletes should make. And, um, I don't know, you know, like I, I want to take time and figure out what fits, you know, like there's a lot of things I like doing, but how many things do you like doing that you are good at, you know, and like that people will pay you for, you know, um, I wouldn't mind working in the industry doing something, but it'd have to be the good company and the right fit, you know? And so I don't want to rush just because I have to have a job. I'll, you know, like it's been cycling takes be good. I think it requires everything of you. It's, you know, you're so used to giving a hundred percent of yourself into everything, every aspect, every day, you know, yeah. it's nice to have those days where you don't have to worry about things anymore. And then, you know, even going to a new job, it's like you have this expectation of yourself that you put in position for things that you used to do that, like, it's not realistic to go into a new job and it being like the priority in your life and you revolve everything around it, you know, so that there has to be a slight reset in how you view the world as well, too. Well, I think this is why, like, Montgomery Securities, like, why Tom Weissel used to hire all these ex-bike racers to do, to, to be traders and to do securities financial stuff for him. Just because used to working and yeah, twenty hours, yeah, and, and really like and not really well, right? Except now, you know, they'd be financially rewarded for that kind of drive and motivation. But he he wanted guys who knew how to you know make those kinds of commitment and and make those kind of commitments and and work hard in that way, and he paid them good money to do it. Um, so I think that can be a pro and a con. I think you're right though. It's like learning. I. I when I was racing, I always had my coaching business. You know, I, I had my coaching business before I turned pro. So I, I always had two things happening, and that was always very difficult for me because I didn't think I was doing the best job I could at either thing. And I always had very, very full days. Um, I don't know what people – well, I guess I see my teammates, what they would do with, quote, unquote, spare time. You know, they would be playing video games or just they'd go to the movies <laughs> or goof off, and I'd be like, what is that like? Um and so you have free time right now, though, legit free time that you've earned, you know, that you deserve. And I don't know what I get. I get depressed when I'm not bored, but not busy. You know, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I have I to stay I, busy. I have an easy time filling my days, man. Yeah, like, what are you doing? <laughs> me? Hang out with my dog. Ride my motorcycle. Ride bike. I don't know. Like, I, I, I have 
I don't ever, I mean, it, I've been in Portland the last year and it's been a little bit of a change just uh, um, location wise because it's been a big city and you don't have the accessibility of certain things, you know, and so um, we're moving back to Bend October and it's just, yeah, I mean, maybe grass is always greener, but like I, I just, I, I enjoy just hanging out with my friends occasionally, riding my bike for a couple hours, riding motorcycles, riding on my dog, like. Yeah, we're pretty pretty easy. God, that sounds awesome. I'm so like that would not make me happy, and I'm jealous of you if you know what I mean. Like, I wish that that could make me happy, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm envious that you uh, that you are happy with those things. It sounds wonderful, you know. Well, I'm I mean, I, sincere. I like my work, you know. Like, if I was when you work, it's like for me, it's one of those things. It's like I can work 16 hours a day, no problem, you know, day in and day out. But if you're not working, like I'm pretty happy. I know I can I can shut it off. You know, right, like right, some people right. like they can only work and then they can only do nothing, or people maybe only do nothing. And I like I'm pretty. And then at work, I want to work hard, right. make right. things yeah, happen. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. if I don't want to work, then I'm just fucking hang out. No, that's good. That's healthy. I'm one of those people who can only work, and I don't necessarily. <laughs> it's not like a, it's not something you brag about, or you're like you think you're better than other people. It's it's a problem. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think it's a negative quality. And I think yeah. being able to have some balance and knowing when to turn it off, like I'm sure. Oh, my dad's the same way. I mean, he's a workaholic. Like, yeah. you know, from the military working 60, yeah. 70 hours a week and he still does the same shit, you know? And like he's 65 years old and still yeah. works. That hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. No, it's just the way you're wired. It's true. Yeah. Um, So I think we'll all, we're all curious to see what will happen next. And um, are you going to come out, visit some races? You're going to, you're going to maybe ride around a little, you're going to jump in a cross crusade. I might do a couple of cross crusades. I'm not going to travel to any races like uh, to, you know, to be there to spectate, you know, and I just don't, that doesn't, me, I don't know. I can, I'd never say never. I thought about going to Vegas because I'm in Utah and I was like, well, it's a six hour drive. And, but it's just like, eh, why? I mean, yeah, I've see, I've seen a lot of bike races. Yeah. But you don't have actually, to go. Like, yeah. I, I never want to go to see the people that like, I, I like dealing with in the industry that are friends of mine that you spend 15 years developing relationships, you know, and you can shoot the shit and like say, Hey, I usually see you four times a year and this is one of the times and like, I'm not going to see you for a while. So like, that's what I, that's the only reason I would miss going is like seeing, you know, friends, but yeah, being home now sounds pretty nice too. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Like it was such a relief not to have to go to Vegas. I mean, yeah, it'd be great to go watch a world cup, but I'll just watch it on TV. Um, to not have to go to Interbike was like, it's exciting when you go to your first one, and then once you figure out what it's all about, it's a relief when you don't have to go anymore. It's like, why do I feel so crappy, man? All I did was walk around. <laughs> it's brutal. I mean, Absolutely drink, brutal. I still feel hungover the next day. You know, yeah. Vegas is a weird place to... Yeah, agreed. Um, okay, uh, I think most importantly after all these things um, is our, our, our crucial question for, for every episode. <laughs> and we're going to use this to wrap things up. Um, we, I started doing the podcast um, either you know, right around when, when Prince died. And so we were talking about Prince a lot and all the shows. And now it's become a regular thing um, where we want to know what your favorite Prince song is. My favorite Prince song? It would have to be ah, A Pussy Control. Oh, interesting. Good. That's a good choice. So I think that's, is that gold experience? Is that, what record is Pussy Control on? My, the only reason I even know that song is Alex Candelario at karaoke one night decided he was going to sing that song. And I don't think he realized it's like 10 minutes long and he didn't know any of the words and he was, had a little couple of community drinks and just kind of just decided to go out there and wing it and it was one of the worst and best things I've seen in a long time. <laughs> well, so because it's on, it's it's in that era of um of um the far the, the artist formerly formerly known as Prince. It's when yeah, he I think was it's just like two thousand. Yeah, or so. no, it's it's off the Gold Experience and Diamonds and Pearls. <laughs> there's a couple of records that came out in that window. It's it's Diamonds and Pearls, Gold Experience. They're terrible, actually, as a whole. Like those albums are are some of the my least favorite Prince records. I feel like it's when he just lost his way a little bit. And like, he, it's when he had a rapper. I mean, he had a rapper, like Prince, come on. Like, it was so sad for me to think <laughs> that he was so lost that he felt like in order to be like relevant or current, he had to copy. It was one of the few times that I felt like Prince was following trends rather than setting them. And, and 
Gold Experience is one of those records. He has a rapper. He's following trends. You know, it's New Power Generation is the band. It's not um, – obviously, it's not the revolution anymore. But all that said, Pussy Control is a jam. That is actually one of the best songs on – on in that period on those records and he, you're right he does that like high pitch whistle that you just ah! yep it's a that's a jam good choice ryan i'm impressed yes I, yeah i more just wanted to try and see if i could sing it online i'm impressed for it. For it. yeah it's, it's like singing the national anthem i'm trying to get that 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 high <laughs> note at the end there and so many people blow that i approve it's a very good choice you've done well right yeah well, uh, thanks, bud. This is great. This is the longest conversation we've ever had. Right. No, one, good. no one's dead. You got my phone number. Yeah, dude. Hopefully um, hopefully our paths will cross in real life and we can have a real life beer. Uh, well, but- the guys at Gloucester were supposed to buy me a plane ticket to come out there and announce and throw things at people. But I don't know. I haven't, I, my inbox is empty with tickets to Boston. So, uh-huh. Well, I'm sure they're listening. Um, yeah. I know a guy. I know Paul. I mean, he's really yeah. upset that like, his winningest racer of his events has retired and I can't add any more Gloucesters to my tally, but I think it'll go on without me. How old are you this year? <laughs> 35. Your... Ah, there you go. Could yeah, do the I mean, Masters I'm race. I'm not racing any more Gloucesters. Dude, I'm racing the Masters race. I signed up for the 35 plus race. I'm not doing the UCI what? race. Dude, yeah. you got to be like 40 plus. Well, You're I'm, 40 though. I'm 45. My racing age. You're doing 35 plus then. Because I felt like doing the forty-five plus race was really sandbagging. <laughs> I thought doing I thought doing thirty-five. I'm racing ten year. I'm racing down ten years. I felt like that's that's an appropriate ex pro thing to do. I'll look for you and your dad bot out there on the course. <laughs> <laughs> I won't be hard to miss. My ass is gigantic. Yeah. So you, you well, see me yeah. more gigantic. Yeah, I think exactly. it's appropriate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. All right, bud. Thanks a lot. Yep, see you. Thanks. Talk to you soon.